Welcome back. It's the Roaring 1920s. Louis de Broglie, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrödinger, and Paul Dirac are still trying to figure out the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Earlier, Niels Bohr did a great job of explaining hydrogen's emission spectrum, and he established discrete energy levels of electrons in orbit. He steered us in the right direction for atomic structure of hydrogen, but his work fell flat for anything more complex than that. It didn't account for electron interactions in multi-electron atoms or ions, let alone anything with a bond. It didn't explain why energy levels existed. It treated electrons as particles in fixed orbits akin to a model of the solar system, and that's just not quite right. In 1924, Louis de Broglie proposed that electrons and all matter exhibit both particle and wave-like properties. Wave-particle duality is completely unintuitive, but what it boils down to is that sometimes the mathematical equations that we have for waves let us calculate things about subatomic particles that are consistent with our observations. And other times, equations that we have for particles work. De Broglie hypothesized that electrons could be described as standing waves, constrained by their orbits around the nucleus. This concept explained why electrons exist in discrete energy levels. It's because only certain wavelengths fit a whole number multiple of times around an orbit. Think of this as akin to how only certain harmonics fit on a vibrating string. This wave-particle duality provided a theoretical foundation for quantum mechanics to develop. In 1927, Werner Heisenberg built on the idea of wave-particle duality and formulated his uncertainty principle. He was considering the limits of how accurately we can measure the properties of subatomic particles. And he found that there is a fundamental limit to how accurately we can simultaneously measure both a particle's position and its momentum. The more accurately we measure one, the less accurately we can determine the other. Think of it like this. This is an electron. We want to find its location and momentum. In order for us to see this electron, we need a photon with the appropriate frequency to bounce off of it. But when the photon bounces off of it, it transfers energy between the electron and the photon. The very act of trying to measure the properties of this electron changed those properties. Let's look at Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in mathematical terms. So delta x is the uncertainty in the position. So it's not the position itself, it's how well we know the position. And delta mv is the uncertainty in the momentum. And when we multiply these two, that result is greater than or equal to a term that's always constant. h is Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. Pi is also a constant. This is a fundamental limit to how well we can know either of these. If the uncertainty of the position is high, the uncertainty of the momentum is low, and vice versa. Now, I am going to rearrange this equation to solve for the uncertainty in a position, and then I'm going to plug in some realistic numbers, then we're going to talk about that. So I rearranged the equation to uncertainty in the position is greater than or equal to Planck's constant. This is a constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th kilograms meter squared per second, divided by four pi times delta mv. This mass that I put in, this is the mass of an electron. And this velocity that I put in isn't the velocity 
of an electron that we measure in a hydrogen atom, it's actually 10% of that value. The reason I'm doing 10% of that value is that we needed an uncertainty in the momentum. So I'm just saying we know the momentum within about 10% of a certain number in a hydrogen atom, just for a realistic number to put in. But what we get is that the uncertainty of the position of an electron, because that's the mass I used, in a hydrogen atom, because that's what I based the velocity uncertainty on, is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 10th meters, or in units of picometers, 260 picometers. Now that is absolutely tiny. If I'm talking about the uncertainty in the position of a person or an airplane or even something tiny like a grain of sand, being uncertain by 260 picometers does not matter. But on the atomic scale, this is huge. The radius of a hydrogen atom is only 53 picometers. So why is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle important? He disproved the idea that electrons travel in fixed orbits, like they did in Niels Bohr's model of the atom. Instead, electrons are best described by probability distributions. In other words, we can determine regions where electrons are likely to be found, but not defined paths. In 1926, Erwin Schrödinger approached this same problem differently. He treated electrons as waves, where Heisenberg had treated them as particles. He developed the Schrödinger equations, which describe the behavior of electrons as wave functions. Now, let's skip over all the math and just get an intuitive feeling for what the Schrödinger equations are saying. Let me ask you a question. What is the location of the wave on a vibrating string? It's all over the string. That entire string is vibrating. So when we ask the same question about a wave-like electron orbiting an atom, what's its location? It's all over the place. The electron is spread out throughout the entire orbital, which is just a region of space. So Schrodinger introduced the concept of orbitals, which are regions with high probability of an electron to be found. He replaced Bohr's circular orbits with these complex 3D shapes. We've named them S, P, D, and F orbitals. One of the questions that Niels Bohr was trying to answer was if opposite charges attract, why do electrons in an atom not just crash into the nucleus. Those are opposite charges. Schrodinger's explanation is that the electron's wave functions are quantized, where Bohr said that the electron's energy levels are quantized. So Heisenberg treated electrons in atoms as particles, and Schrodinger treated them as waves. But their results agree. That is wave particle duality. Schrodinger's electron clouds are visualizations of the uncertainty in an electron's position in an atom. We don't know exactly where they are, but they like to spend a lot of their time in regions with these shapes. In 1928, Paul Dirac merged quantum mechanics with Einstein's special relativity. He was able to predict the existence of both electron spin and antimatter, or positrons. His Dirac equations further cemented the idea that electron behavior follows probabilistic rules rather than orbital paths. In a nutshell, we have three subatomic particles. Protons are in the nucleus, have a positive charge, and the number of protons in the nucleus determines the identity of the element. That number is called the atomic number, and it's found on the periodic table. Second, we have the neutron. It has no charge, but a mass that's similar to that of the proton. It is also found in the nucleus. And third, we have electrons. They are in orbitals, negatively charged, and their mass is about 1,800 times smaller than that of either a proton or a neutron. Their locations are given as probability distributions. 
that we call orbitals. Those orbitals come in four main types, S, P, D, and F, but that's for another video. Now, tell me down in the comments, what are you struggling with this week in chemistry? Thanks for watching Chemistry in a Nutshell. If you feel that I've earned it, please like this video and subscribe to my channel.